First, I would like to welcome everybody for, um, and thank you for taking some time out of your day to be here. Amazed to see that there is at least one person here who, from Egypt, where it's three o'clock in the morning. And uh, just thanks to everybody, uh, wherever you are, whatever time it is where you are, um, for taking some time out of your day to learn about this um, amazing topic. So I am Susan Sullivan. I am the Director of Education and Outreach at Ceres, which is an environmental sciences research institute. We are at the University of Colorado Boulder. And, in, and uh, I want to tell you about a couple of the interactive features on the webinar right now, if you're just joining us. There's a couple of ways that you can interact um, with each other and with the presenters. So uh, first of all, if you look at the top or, the, or it may be at the bottom of your screen, there's uh, places that say chat and a place that says Q&A. So for the chat, that's a place where you can put in a comment. If you know about a great resource that you want to put in the chat for everybody, you're welcome to do that. We like to have this be an interactive space where you can know that even though you're on the computer, you're actually learning about this topic with, uh, you know, a number of other people. So um, it's not just into the void. And then you also have a place there called Q&A. And that's what we'll be using um, to do discussion after the formal presentation part of the webinar. If you have a question for the presenters, you can put it into the Q&A, and that will ensure that it doesn't get lost in the chat. You also have an option, if you've joined by computer, you have an option to raise your hand at that time and uh, you can be, you can ask your question directly by voice. And uh, Jennifer will elevate you so that you can, so that you can do that. Um, so if you've joined by computer, then everything's free. If you've joined by phone, that is not toll free. So just be aware of that. If that's, if that's an issue, you can always, rejoin using the computer, if that's the thing. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll uh, go on to, uh, to the rest of these things. I uh, want to make you aware of a couple of events that are coming up. This webinar is number two in a three-part series. The uh, first webinar which happened last month is archived on our website if, you, uh, if you'd like to go take a look at that one. And that was great. Um, this one will be archived um, very soon. And then the next webinar is March 10th at the same time uh, on a Thursday. Now we're also, if you are in the Boulder area, in the Denver metro area, um, and if you are a person who works with other people on um, soil or microbial topics, you are encouraged to sign up on our wait list now for our May 9th and 10th hands-on workshop. So at this point, um, all the slots on the workshop are full, but we do anticipate that we're going to have some attrition and that we'll have a couple of spots open up. So if you're interested in that, um, please sign up and let us know you want to be on the wait list and uh, and we'll put you there you know who knows if we get a lot of interest in this topic that's good for us to know for for future offerings so make sure we're aware um, Patrick you asked how do I get on the list the um, the website is up at the top of that slide and then uh, Jennifer if you would put that in the chat that would make it available for people and you can um, you can sign up there and get on the get on the wait list, and also register for the next webinar if that's if that looks good to you. Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome our presenters. This uh, this series is uh, funded through a research project from the National Science Foundation that um, Noah Fier has, and this is a, a portion of that project which is about reaching out to the community about microbiology. Um, <clears throat> Noah is a associate professor at, in the eBio department at University of Colorado Boulder. He's also one of the fellows of my institute, the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences. 
and he's co-presenting today with Hannah Holland Moritz. And uh, Hannah was previously with uh, University of California Davis, and she's only in this last year come to join Noah's group in as part of the Fierro Lab. So. Uh, with that, I want to thank both of you for taking time out of your evening to do this. And I've seen your, uh, I've seen your slides, and I'm looking forward to a really fantastic um, presentation. So it, now's a good time for you to share your screen, and we can switch over to your slides. Let us know if you need any help. Okay, does that work? Works for me. Does everybody else see it? Okay. Okay, so um, I'm a microbial ecologist. This is Noah talking. I'm a microbial ecologist. And what does that mean? That means essentially if I have to boil down what my lab group does, we, we study microbial diversity in the environment. And in addition to just seeing what kind of diversity is out there in the environment, we try to link microbes to animal, plant, and ecosystem health. Essentially try to understand what they're doing in their respective environments. And my group works in a lot of different microbial habitats. You may not think of them as microbial habitats, but that's the way I think of it. So we do a lot of work in soil. Um, we, do, we do some work looking at microbes on plant leaves, and Hannah will talk a little bit about that today. Uh, we also do some work looking at microbes inside your home and essentially your home as a microbial ecosystem and that will be the subject of, of the next webinar. Uh, we also do some work looking at microbes in the atmosphere, microbes in animals including humans and arthropods including uh, uh, caterpillars, moths, uh, sorry, moths and butterflies and their, and their caterpillars. Um, and, and just to kick it off, I want to highlight that it's a, it's a really, I think it's a really fun time to be a microbial ecologist. And it's really, just in general, if you're interested in microbes, it's really an exciting time. And I say this for a couple of reasons. One reason is there's no shortage of study organisms. Um, in addition, there's just no shortage of environments that we can study. So if we look at the numbers of microbes that are out there, just some, some, some example environments. So if we look in soil, we've got about a billion cells per gram of soil. A gram is you know, a small tablespoon, I guess, or, or, or less than that. If you look at a leaf surface, you've got you know, basically 100,000 cells per, per square centimeter of leaf surface. And this is primarily bacteria. Even in the atmosphere, you've got up to a million cells, bacteria, fungi, other microbes in general per meter cube, and money, just as another example that we probably don't think of as a microbial habitat, you know, you've got 10 million cells per square centimeter on money. And, and if you look at money under a microscope, it's simply astounding. It's just coated in bacteria. So, you know, so they're abundant, uh, they're ubiquitous in nearly every environment that we look at. Um, this is good news if you're a, a microbiologist or a microbial ecologist. It's bad news if you're a germaphobe. But most of these microbes are, of course, harmless. Um, they're not doing, and some of them can be bad, but most of them, most of them are harmless. Some of them in particular environments can even be beneficial. So let's put this number in perspective. So I already talked about in a lot of these environments, there's lots of numbers of bacteria, for example. But they're small, but if you add it up and you do kind of a back of the envelope calculation, about half of the biomass on Earth is microbial. So if you think about this, when you're walking through a forest or if you're swimming in the ocean, about half of the living biomass that's around you is biomass that you can't see, organisms that you can't see, or at least not with, a, with the naked eye. So they're ubiquitous, they're abundant, and they represent a large fraction of just the living, living biomass on Earth. Um, the other reason I think it's really fun to study microbes is uh, most of the biological diversity on Earth is actually microbial. In other words, it's represented by organisms that are single-celled, so individual cells that you basically can't see with, it, with the naked eye. So if it's been a while since you've had biology, um, this is the current tree of life, as, as best we understand it, or some, some semblance of it. So there's three broad domains of life. We have the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. Okay, so... Um, a couple things I want to point out here. So everything that's shown in pink, these are groups of organisms or lineages of organisms that are, are solely microbial. In other words, these are single-celled organisms or primarily single-celled organisms that we can't see, at least with the naked eyes, small things. Blue just shows those, 
groups of organisms that do have some multicellular lineages and, and examples of organisms that we can actually see, like animals, for example. And then also note that we are here. This is uh, animals shown with the, the red arrow. And I always like showing this because it, it highlights that we're really closely related to fungi. And I think that's really good for our, uh, our hubris to remind ourselves that in the grand scheme of things, we're actually really closely related to mushrooms and molds and stuff like that. So a lot of microbial diversity that's out there. And the other reason I think it's really been, uh, uh, it, it's really a fun time to be studying microbial ecology is right now there's this broad paradigm shift that's not only going on in the field of microbial ecology, it's also going on in, in sort of general understanding of, of microbiology and microbes in the environment. And that is, is it used to be that we consider microbes are bad, right? They're germs. So the only good microbe is a dead microbe. And this is true often in medicine, right? You know, there's clearly organisms that are bad, organisms that we don't want around us. But then there's also a lot of organisms that we find in our environment, on our bodies, in our bodies that are totally harmless. So I think the new paradigm is that there's, there, there clearly are a few microbes that are pathogens. Um, but many of them are harmless and perhaps even beneficial in, cer in certain circumstances. And I think the most obvious example of this paradigm shift is in our understanding of the microbes in our gut or the microbes in our large intestine, where now it's, it's very common knowledge that everyone knows like, oh, yeah, you have lots of microbes in your gut. And these things do important things for us. In fact, the other day I was on a plane flight and somebody asked me what I do. So I start telling them, I, you know, keep it to a minimum, right? Um, and then next thing I know, I get this half an hour discussion about the gastrointestinal distress this guy is suffering and how his micro microbes in his gut are out of balance and you know, stuff like that. So it's, I think, just highlighting that you know, this, this paradigm shift is not just occurring in the, in the field of microbiology, but it's also more general. And as one example of that, I think this is probably the first example. This is a recent issue of National Geographic. And I think, to, to my knowledge, it's the only time microbes have ever been featured on the cover of National Geographic. And this is just a quote from, from the article. They're invisible, they're everywhere, and they rule. And they rule. Well, that pretty much sums it up. Um, and it's just, again, just highlights this sort of broader understanding of the microbes that live in the environment, whether we're talking about soil or plant leaves or, or the human body. And it's even extended to, to kids' literature. So this is my daughter holding up one of her favorite books, or at least I like to think that it's one of her favorite books. It's called Tiny Creatures, The World of Microbes. And that's essentially the take-home message of this book. They're invisible, they're everywhere, and they rule. Um, and the other reason, so the last reason I want to give for why I think it's a really exciting time to be uh, studying microbiology and microbes out there in the environment, environment is, is, that we, is that we now global diversity that we didn't have available to us even just a few years ago. So for example, for microbiology has been around for 200 years at least. And for most of that 200 years, this is how we studied microbes. We'd either look at them under a microscope or we put them, try to grow them on a petri plate. So most of you are probably familiar with petri plates from high school biology or undergraduate biology, or even if you've just gone to a doctor and gotten a strep, strep test. This is what they'll do. They'll take a swab and put it on a plate and see what bacteria grow up. And this, these are very useful methods, of course. Um, there's been, a, you know, they've really revolutionized our understanding of microbes. The problem is a lot of microbes out there in the environment, whether we're talking about soil or on plant leaves or on the human skin, don't like to grow under these conditions in these, in these sort of artificial lab environments on these petri plates. And also, even if you look at them under a microscope, it's hard to identify them. Let's face it, microbes aren't the most morphologically interesting organisms, typically. You know, they're kind of round, some of them are rectangular, some of them are, are spiral-shaped, but it's very hard to identify them just by looking at them under the microscope. And fortunately, over the past decade or two decades, there's really been this, this rapid growth in the development of using DNA, so using genetic material to start identifying and surveying the amount, of the, the, the amount of microbial diversity that's out there. And this has really revolutionized the field because we've realized that there's a lot more microbial diversity that's out there. Um, and we can start studying that and see, see what sort of organisms are out there in the environment. And on top of that, the ease of getting this, this DNA sequence information, this um, uh, surveying microbial diversity using this genetic material, it's rapidly increased. So just to give you a feel for this, so DNA sequencing is a tool we use a lot in my lab group to start looking at microbes, whether we're talking about human skin or soil. And the, the cost of doing DNA sequencing has dropped dramatically. So to give you a feel for this, so this is the cost to, generate, to sequence a human genome. Of course, we're not talking about human genomes here, but the technology is actually the same, whether we're talking about um, genes in bacteria or genes in humans. 
So in 2002, it cost $100 million to sequence the human genome. And now it's pretty close to about $1,000 per human genome. This is a cost of a brief office visit in, uh, in, in, in many medical offices. So what this has done is it's made it possible now for us to do lots of research looking at these microbes in all sorts of different environments. You know, in five, 10 years ago, you could get a PhD by studying one soil sample and looking at the microbes that are there. And now it's really allowed us these, these advances in sequencing technologies. We can look at hundreds, if not thousands of soil samples and really get much more detailed understanding of the diversity that's around there. So what we want to do today is just give a couple examples of what we're learning about microbial diversity that's out there in, in a couple different environments. So I'll now hand it over to Hannah. Great. So, um, Hannah speaking. Uh, so I'm going to talk about microbes that live on leaves, which, as Noah mentioned earlier, might not be a surface that you really expect to find a lot of microbes on, but turns out there's microbes living on leaves. So here, as just a couple of examples, there's a, a fungi um, living on a walnut leaf. And on this lilac leaf, you can see there's some bacteria hanging out here and around these stomata, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So um, life on a leaf is actually not particularly easy. Uh, turns out that it's a, not, there's not a lot of food or water on a leaf, and you're also continuously being baked by the sun. So um, the plant wants to keep all of its water and nutrients inside of it. So it's got this cuticle, this waxy covering on the outside that prevents that water and nutrients from getting to the surface of the leaf where a lot of the bacteria live. So you might be listening to this and thinking, oh, hey, you know what that sounds like? Sounds like living in a desert, right? And yes, in many ways it is like living in a desert, but uh, the desert surface of a leaf is not like this desert that we see here. It's actually a lot more like this desert. So if you look at this picture of the desert, there's you know, a lot of different kinds of trees. They're kind of interspersed among the rocks and there's a lot of different things there, right? It's a very diverse environment. And that's also what we see on leaves when we look at them. So um, these microbes actually live kind of in the gullies and the, the little oases that you have on a little leaf. So the leaf surface is not entirely flat. There's kind of bumps and ridges and that's where the water collects. So that's where we find the microbes when we find them on the leaves. So you might be wondering, okay, so these leaves are hard to live in, they're like a desert, so what actually is living there? Um, well, I study mosses, and so one really interesting thing that we found on these mosses that I'm looking at are methanotrophs. So methanotroph, what does that mean? So methanotroph is a bacteria that eats methane. Methane is in natural gas, it's the primary component of natural gas, and these uh, methanotrophs essentially make a living off of eating what we would usually burn for fuel. Um, another thing that lives on these mosses, kind of going up the uh, food chain a little bit, are these testate amoeba. So testate just means that it's got a shell. And these testate amoeba are pretty cool. So they eat diatoms, um, but much like a Greek hero and a legend, right? Before they eat these other small microbes called diatoms, diatoms also have shells. So they eat the diatoms and then they make a glue and they glue the diatom shells to their shell to kind of like add to their armor. So it's kind of this bizarre, almost um, weird, like mythological creature that's just living on moss in the forest. They're also colonized by these green organisms, which are essentially the plants, the microbe world, they're photosynthesizing, so they're taking energy from the sun, turning it into food, they go into the testate amoeba. And it turns out that the amoeba really like having these inside of them, they live better lives when they have these organisms. So the organisms living are not singular organisms, they actually interact with each other in a community of organisms. So they're all interconnected, much like you would think of, you know, a sea otter living in a kelp forest or some other example of a larger ecosystem. So um, that's moss, but it's not just plants in the woods, right? It's any plants. All of these have microbial communities, including the produce at the supermarket. So um, John Leff 
a gra another graduate student in our lab, was really interested to know whether uh, organic produce and conventional produce are have the same microbial communities or not. And so he went to the grocery store and he got all of these different uh, kinds of things, so mushrooms and some strawberries and lettuce and apples and stuff. And he looked and he was wondering, okay, so are there differences? And it turns out, indeed, yes, there are differences between organic and conventional produce. Now the question is, is that good? Is it bad? And the answer is, we don't know. So we can't say one way or another whether it's good or bad, but we do know that if you're eating uh, organic or conventional produce solely, you're getting exposed to different communities of microorganisms. So this is my favorite example, actually, of a bacteria that grows on uh, plant leaves. And um, this bacteria can create ice. So what happens is it turns out you can cool water below freezing temperature and it won't turn into ice. It needs something to kind of spark that reaction off, to start the ice formation process. And these bacteria are able to do that. And I actually have a video here today, so we'll see if that can play. Um, it's gonna play, oh great. So here, this woman, she's got some of this ice creating bacteria in a vial and she's got some super cooled water. And what she's gonna do, it's, so it's liquid water, and she's just gonna drip a little bit in, and boom, turns to ice, right? So what's happening there is that the bacteria can hold the water into, uh, let's see if I can bring back the PowerPoint. It's this guy? Great, okay. So what's happening there is that the bacteria, this is Pseudomonas syringae is the name of this bacteria, it holds the water molecules in the same way, uh, orientation they would be held in an ice crystal, and that's enough to start the crystallization process. So why would bacteria want to make ice? It's kind of weird, right? Like, why would that happen? And we don't really know, uh, as with many things, but there's two hypotheses. So the first one is maybe it's for food, right? Uh, that cuticle outside on the leaf surface is really hard to get through. So maybe if you, you know, freeze the leaf, you can break open the cuticle and then you can get into all the juicy stuff on the inside. The other hypothesis is transportation, right? So if you're a bacteria living on a leaf and you get blown off by the wind and you get up, you, now you're in the clouds, how are you going to get back down? Well, if you can form an ice crystal, then you can become a drop of rain. If you can become a drop of rain, then you can fall back down onto the crops that you like to live on. So that's the second uh, kind of hypothesis about why these bacteria are doing this. Um, but we don't really care why they're doing it in some ways because we can co-opt it anyway, right? So um, one example of this is in an ice cannon, right? So you can create snow using these bacteria to nucleate the ice formation. So now I think Noah is gonna talk about bacteria on skin. So now for something completely different. So just another, again, another example of sort of, just this is another example of microbial diversity that's out there and we, how we can start looking at it. Um, and this is an example that's a little bit closer to home. Um, and if we, and our body is filled with microbes. So you have about 100 trillion microbial cells in the human body. Okay, 100 trillion, what does that mean? So if you add up the mass of these microbes, and it's primarily bacteria, if you add up their mass, it's about the same weight as your brain. So I'll, I'll leave out any metaphors there or anything like that, but um, just goes to show that there's just enormous uh, biomass of microbes. And most of these are, of course, in our gut, specifically in our large intestine but they're all over our bodies. And you know, we have lots of microbes on our skin, in our mouth, in our nose, ear, basically you, name, you pick an orifice or a part of the body and there, there's gonna be uh, bacteria there. Um, but I think perhaps what's most interesting about this is that there's a lot of genetic information contained in these microbes that live on in our bodies. So just to put this in context, you have about 20,000 human genes. So in other words, you have 20,000 genes that code for various different things and make us who we are. Um, 
if you add up the genes uh, that are found in the microbes that live on and in our bodies, we're talking about 20 million microbial genes. So what this means is that the amount of genetic diversity that's on us and in us just held in the microbes is actually larger than the amount of genetic diversity just held in our own genome. And in particular, it means that our microbiome, these microbes that live on us and in us, provide us with, a, with important traits that we did not need to evolve on our own. For example, a lot of the digestion that occurs when you eat a sandwich, particularly, uh, or, or a salad, for example, a lot of the digestion is actually carried out by the microbes that live in our large intestine. And so we rely on these microbes. And, and if you um, it hindered that community by, for example, applying antibiotics, those of you that have been on heavy duty antibiotics know that oftentimes you have a hard time digesting food. Um, so that's just one example. Another example is we rely on these microbes to protect us from pathogens. So again, some of these microbes are pathogenic or are harmful, but a lot of them are harmless and, protect, and perhaps even beneficial. So both in the gut and in the skin, there's examples of microbes that can actually inhibit the growth of bad bacteria or pathogenic bacteria or pathogenic fungi, for example. So they are able to do a lot of things that it's, it's difficult for our body to do single-handedly. So we rely on these microbes that live on our bodies and in our bodies. So I wanna talk about one example where we've been looking at microbes that live on skin. So this picture is basically somebody took their hand and stuck it on a Petri plate and grew it up for uh, probably a couple days to see what types of bacteria live on human skin. So if this isn't good advertisement for why you should wash your hands, I don't know what to say. But there's all sorts of bacteria living on your hands. And, the, and again, what I want to highlight is only a small fraction of the bacteria that actually live on your hands will grow under these conditions. So this is just showing you know, some that were growing. You can, in each of these individual colonies here, we're talking about million or thousands or millions of, of bacterial cells. So there's, again, just highlighting the amount of bacteria that live on your hand and the diversity of, of organisms that live on your hand. But let's zoom in here. Let's look at some bacteria on your, on your skin surface. This is a hair follicle on your skin. All these green things are little bacteria. So we're talking about things that are you know, on the order of about a micron in size. So this is a thousand, thousandth of a millimeter. Um, and they're all over your skin surface. They're, they're usually not uniformly distributed, uh, distributed, just like Hannah talked about with the leaf surface. You tend to see a lot more bacteria close to hair follicles or, or close to pores um, than you see in other locations. Um, and some of these are actually growing on your skin. So they're living off of the um, organic material that's coming out of your skin cells or out of the oils that come from your pores and so forth, and they're, and they're growing there. And some of them are just sort of transitory. They, they, you pick them up as you go about your daily life, as you touch things, as you, um, you know, wave your hand through the air, you're picking up these bacteria. They're probably not growing there, but we can at least pick them up on your skin surface, and they may be there for some period of time. So a few years ago, um, we just got interested in applying some of these DNA sequencing technologies to look at what kind of bacterial diversity is out there. We said, all right, let's look at some bacterial diversity on skin. So this was a postdoc in my lab at the time, Chris Lauber. And his claim to fame is that he was one of the most sampled man in microbiome history. There was something like three terabytes of data that just came from the microbes on and inside his body. Um, and so we said, we made him sit patiently and we swabbed all these different areas on his skin surface to start looking at the diversity of bacteria on his face, basically. And this is what we found. So this is essentially a map of bacterial diversity on his face. Um, so red indicates higher levels of diversity. Just for scale, we're talking about 300 species of bacteria. It's a bit hard to define what a bacterial species is. Um, so that's hence the quotes there. So about 300 species of bacteria in red, and then blue means lower diversity. This is sort of like a uh, low diversity desert environment. We're only seeing about 50 species, but it's still pretty diverse. And you can notice that there's actually a lot of variability in diversity on different patches of his skin. So we've got these hot spots of diversity on his lips, for example. And this is primarily because not only do you have skin bacteria there, but you also get bacteria from your mouth um, mixing in, um, uh, entering the mix. Um, you know, and, and the cheeks are sort of an area of low diversity. And if you look, interestingly, um, on the, uh, you know, above his nose, there was, again, another hot spot. This is sort of the Amazon rainforest of bacterial diversity on his face. And we're not sure why this is, but he does wear glasses. So probably this is a little microenvironment generated by the, the glasses on, on, the, on the bridge of his nose that's generating these unique environments for microbes. So a lot of diversity on the face, and we can start picking out some predictable patterns. Uh, the other thing we want to do is be like, uh, it was ask a very simple question, what sorts of, bacteria live on the hand surface. 
again, people have been studying bacteria on hand surfaces for, for many decades. Um, but this is one of the one of the, the first times people had used um, sort of this, this high throughput sequencing where we can look at this diversity in great detail to start assessing how much diversity is actually there on the hand surface. And we picked the palm surface because uh, most people have a palm surface. Um, it's a very easy place to sample. It's not very invasive. And we actually sampled um, a little over 100 undergraduates that were all taking a general biology exam. And we did that because they were, we knew they were all in the same room for at least an hour or two and roughly the same age, all reasonably healthy. Um, and, and we knew they hadn't washed their hands in at least an hour or two because they were all in there taking the exam. So as they came out of the exam, we swabbed their hand with essentially a, a sterile Q-tip. And we took that Q-tip back in the lab, we extracted DNA from it, and then we started looking like how many different species of bacteria did we find on the average student's hand uh, on their palm surface. And the answer was, was a bit surprising. So for, for women, on average, we're seeing about 150, 160 different species of bacteria per palm surface, okay? And on, on men, it's a bit lower, typically around 100 to 125. So what I'm showing here is diversity, sorry, number of species on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is number of sequences. So we can think of this as kind of pulling bacteria off the skin and, and identifying them and looking for new species. And one thing I want to point out is that this line keeps going up, which means that if we had sampled even more and did even more detailed surveying of the bacteria, we'd keep finding new species the, the harder we looked. Um, but the one thing you're probably wondering is why do women have more bacteria on their palm surface than men? And I have no idea. Um, we don't know. Um, so one thing I want to point out, I'm not saying women have more bacteria. They have more types of bacteria than men. So it's not like they're dirtier or anything like that. They just have more types of bacteria. And this may be a good thing. We just don't know. And again, we also don't know why this is. It could be related to salinity, which can differ between uh, men and women's hands. could relate to pH of the skin surface. Um, we're not sure exactly what's driving this pattern, but this has been seen over and over again when people have looked at bacteria on the palm surface. But I think what was most interesting from this study is that we found that there's relatively few bacteria that are actually shared between any two individuals you pick out at random. So only about 13% of the bacterial species found on your, on your palm are actually shared on average between any two people. So the bacteria on your, on your hand are kind of like snowflakes, right? Everything, everyone is unique. Um, and this was, this was interesting to us. We expected just everyone to be pretty similar. Um, and most of the, the species would be shared. And in fact, that's not true. Most people don't share many bacteria in common. So this led to a, a next study that came a, a few years later. We said, okay, given this, given this uniqueness of the bacteria on your hand, can we use your bacteria for forensics? And we did this, as, this is just one example of a project we did for this, for this study. Where what, what we wanted to ask is if you have a surface that you touch regularly, can we look at the bacteria left on that, on that surface? Because every time you touch a surface, you leave some bacteria behind. Can we look at the bacteria there and figure out who would touch that surface? So what I'm showing here is a study where we took three individuals, a blue individual, a red individual, and a black individual, shown by these three different colors here. Um, and we sampled each finger on their hand. So 10 samples from, from their hands. And we also sampled most of the keys or many of the keys on their keyboard. And this is a keyboard that hadn't been used for 24 hours. And it was just used by one person. So we had keyboards from, a, from the, the red colored person here, keyboards from the blue and so on. And what we show, this is, don't, I'm basically collapsing all this information. Because remember, we're talking about hundreds of different bacterial species here. I'm just collapsing it into a, into a plot. And all you need to know is that symbols that are close together represent samples with similar bacterial communities. And what you can see is that the, not only do the samples cluster out by the three individuals, but they also cluster, each individual clusters with the bacteria left on their computer keyboard. So in other words, you can start identifying who would potentially start identifying who would touch your keyboard by comparing the bacteria on your fingertips to those bacteria left behind on your keyboard. And we did a number of other studies showing that you're actually fairly stable over time in terms of what bacteria you have on your skin, and that you, know, you can even do this if you just touch an object once, you can look at the bacteria that are left on the object and match it up with a fairly high degree of accuracy to the individual that it, that it actually touched it. Um, so this is just proof of concept. We're not putting anybody in jail with this technology or anything like that. It was just showing that this may be a possible forensics tool in the future, more just kind of, uh, this was interesting. Um, 
but what was funny was this was picked up uh, by the writers of CSI Miami. Um, and you know, about a month after the paper came out where we presented this you know, potential forensics tool, there was an episode of CSI Miami where they used this. They had, were trying to figure out who would touch the computer keyboard, so they used the bacterial diversity left on the keyboard, and so on and so forth. Um, so I thought this was interesting for a few reasons. This is one is it showed that actually somebody actually reads these papers that we write. And two, you know, this episode aired only a few months after we had written the paper. So I thought it was, it was amazing that they were able to read the paper, integrate it into the script, film it, and air it all in a fairly short period of time. And science never moves that fast. So I, I was quite jealous. Um, so now you're probably wondering, okay, so I, I told you that you know, if you look at skin, each of us are, have pretty unique skin bacterial communities. The same is actually true for your gut as well. There's relatively little overlap at the species level in terms of the types of bacteria that we see in different individuals, even health, individuals that are all healthy. So, so one question that comes up is why do, we, do each of us harbor such unique microbial communities? Is it genetics? Is it parental influences? Are we just getting those bacteria when we're kids, this is my daughter here doing some lab work. Um, are we just getting those bacteria from, from our parents? Is it diet? We do know that in some cases you can change the microbes both on your skin and in your, in your gut by changing your diet, lifestyle, hygiene practices. Are we just picking up a lot of these bacteria from our surroundings and that's what's leading to these difference, differences in the bacterial communities? Is it the surroundings when you were three, year old, three years old that are dictating what types of bacteria you have as an adult? These are all questions that we don't know the answers to. And this list can keep going on and on of some factors that we think are influencing the types of bacteria that you find on and in your body. Um, one thing we do know is it's not as simple as just genetics, genetics explains this. So there's been a number of studies that have shown that identical twins harbor gut bacterial communities that are no more similar than non-identical twins. And this seems to be true also to some degree with skin bacterial communities. So there may be some genetic component of specific bacteria found in your gut or in your skin or in your mouth. But in general, you can't just look at someone's genome or know their, their genetic relatedness to someone else and figure out what types of bacteria they're going to have on their skin or in their gut. Um, lots, again, lots of other factors that could be influencing this. Um, one study we did a few years back with, with a, researcher, a research group at University of Puerto Rico was we looked at the effects of vaginal delivery versus C-section delivery on those microbes that are found on infants soon after they were born. And what we did is we looked at the bacteria on the skin and in the, in the vagina and the mouth, all these body habitats of the mother, and then the, the comparable habitats on the infant uh, soon after they were born. What we found, don't worry about the colors here, this is just talking about showing different bacteria. What I wanna show is that if you look at the vaginally delivered bacteria on the infant, the infant's microbiome, so those bacteria that live on and in the infant, essentially just look like uh, those bacteria in the mother's vagina, which isn't surprising as they're coming out, they're basically getting coated in all these bacteria from the mother's vagina. And in contrast, if you look at C-section delivered infants, their bacteria on their bodies actually looks much more like skin bacteria. And in particular, those bacteria, they don't actually look that much like the, the skin bacteria of the mother. In fact, they look a lot more like, well, we didn't sample them, but it, it, they're probably the skin bacteria coming from the nurse, the doctor, or you know, as somebody else that was in you know, the, the spouse or whoever was, was the, the, essentially the first to touch the infant. And there was the, the really the initial inoculation of the infant with these, with these skin bacteria. So this just shows that there's a, this, you know, even at birth, you can start picking out these differences in the microbiome. And in this case, just depending on whether the infant was vaginally delivered or, or C-section delivered. Um, we also know from some work that individuals sharing the same household uh, typically share more similar bacterial communities, even if they're unrelated. Um, so the question is why, and we think there's probably two general reasons why this is the case. And this is true both for skin bacteria and for gut bacteria, and to a lesser degree also, also for mouth bacteria. So there's, a, there's a, a handful of reasons why this could be. One reason is just that, that we're essentially picking up a lot of bacteria from our surroundings. Right, so if you live in the same room, you're gonna be exposed to a lot of the same bacteria, and you're gonna be picking those up and integrating them into your skin microbiome or your gut microbiome. And the other is, of course, there's gonna be a lot of exchange of microbes between individuals living in the same household, either direct or indirect exchange of these, of these bacteria. Um, so this got led us into a series of projects uh, a few years ago, sort of investigating, well, what microbes are living in the house? Okay, so if, if it's possible that we're picking up a lot of bacteria from our homes, 
what are we getting from our homes? And so I'll be talking more about this at the next webinar, but I think it's been really fun to think of the home as a microbial ecosystem and what microbes are, are there and how does it vary on different surfaces and so forth. Um, and so we, we did a project that, again, I'll be talking mostly about at the, at the next webinar. This is my daughter, again, showing her excellent microbiology technique. Uh, she's sampling her mother's hand and sampling different surfaces in the lab. Uh, I'm sorry, different surfaces in the home. And again, just to get a feel for what microbes are we actually exposed to in our home, and can we see some influence of our bodies on those micro, microbes in our homes and vice versa. Um, I will also point out that we didn't use these samples because what you don't see in these pictures is immediately after she collected these samples, she stuck them in her mouth. Um, so we didn't use them for any, any uh, further analyses. So, so we're starting to get a handle of the types of bacteria that are found on our skin and gut and other body habitats. We're starting to get an understanding of what factors can influence the types of bacteria we see on our bodies. But there's a lot of questions that are still basically left unanswered. For example, one of them is, well, what's a good skin microbial community? So I already told you, if you, looked at, uh, if you look at a bunch of presumably healthy people, there's this enormous variability in the types of bacteria that you see, but they're all reasonably healthy. So how do you start identifying a good skin bacterial uh, community? And, and what does that mean? And, and what are sort of the, the downstream health implications of having different microbial communities? And that's definitely an area of active research that we're only just starting to scratch the surface on and starting to understand sort of the more practical applications of this, of this microbial diversity work. So now I'll, I'll pass it over to Hannah here. Great. So uh, just to kind of wrap things up, I guess the next question you guys might be thinking about is, so how, like, what is the point of all this? And, and the ultimate goal is to try and manipulate, how can we manipulate these microbial communities or these microbes to our advantage, right? And so there's already a couple of examples out there. Uh, for example, with microbial community or with a certain microbial uh, makeup, you can produce a better tasting strawberry. So this bacteria, Methylobacterium extorcans, um, naturally lives on strawberries. And what people have found is that you, if you put more of it on a strawberry, the strawberry tastes better. And the reason is that uh, this chemical, furaniol. So furaniol is the chemical that makes strawberries taste like strawberries, one of two chemicals. And it turns out that methylobacterium extorcans is making lactaldehyde, which is the precursor to this chemical furaniol. So if you add more uh, methylobacterium, you get more lactaldehyde, and then you get more furaniol. So your strawberries taste better. Um, another example, which is really cool, if you remember the Pseudomonia syringiae, the ice creating bacteria. Well, it's not just creating ice, it's also a pathogenic bacteria. It uh, creates these lesions in, um, for example, this is a tomato plant that it's infected. Uh, but what researchers have found is if you add this other bacterial species, Sphingomonas, to a plant that's been infected with Pseudomonas syringiae, uh, you can protect the plant from the pathogen. So here, there's an infected plant here. This one, is, or this one is healthy, it's not been infected at all. And here is an infected plant plus Sphingomonas. So you see the infected plus Sphingomonas looks a lot like a healthy plant. Um, so this is a, a probiotic, if you will, for plants, right? So what about with human skin? So there's not been a ton of research done on humans, or there has, but we can't quite manipulate them in the same way we would plants because we want to keep them healthy and safe and happy. Um, but we do know that there are these trends with, for example, babies who have been uh, delivered via C-section versus vaginal birth. Uh, they tend to have more um, uh, autoimmune disorders like uh, asthma. Uh, than babies delivered by vaginal birth. And the assumption that people have been making is that perhaps the microbiome, their skin microbes, have something to do with this. And we don't know, but there's actually just been a study um, that's starting to look at this, uh, whether uh, putting vaginal microbes onto a C-section birth baby uh, makes a difference in these long-term effects. Uh, so with that, I'll kind of go to the takeaways from this talk. So 
what have we learned? Microbes live in on all around us, on our plants, pretty much anywhere in our homes. Um, they're diverse, they're kind of weird, uh, and as Noah pointed out earlier, they rule. Uh, not, our, not all are bad, right? Like sphingomonas, some can be really helpful, and if we can identify those helpful ones, then that can be really useful. So, of course, the ultimate goal is that by studying these communities, we can manipulate them to improve our health and to also control the microbial environments around us. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Um, first, Katie asks, are there climate change implications of the methanotrophs and um, could they sequester um, methane? Uh, so that remains to be seen, but uh, yeah, that's actually a lot of people who are studying methanotrophs are really kind of interested in where these methanotrophs are. You do have to be a little careful though because um, different environments, right? It's all about the net carbon sequestration or whether, you know, the if an environment is producing more methane, for example, uh, there might be methanogens, organisms that create methane also living near these mosses. And so if the net is really zero, then that's not uh, very useful in the grand scheme of things. But yeah, definitely, there's a lot of research being done on that. And then a second climate-related question is can micro uh, that Adam asks, can microbial habitats tell us anything interesting about climate patterns? Yes, maybe I'll, I'll take this one. So, um, I mean, it's an interesting question because clearly microbes, whether we're talking about microbes in soil or microbes on mosses, they're, they're clearly going to be sensitive to changes in precipitation, for example, or changes in temperature. Um, and that, that's a great question, you know, so what does that mean? Like, for example, if we're talking about these methane degrading bacteria on mosses, you know, methane is a potent greenhouse gas and there's these bacteria that are potentially degrading some of that methane before it bubbles out of these, these, these bogs or, or, or swampy areas. So, you know, are they going to be more sensitive to, to climate change and, you know, may we end up with more or less methane bubbling out of these systems? It, it's unclear. Um, and part of the problem is, right, there's so many factors that influence microbes and, and temperature and moisture availability are just some of them. Um, but that's a question that a lot of people are really actively interested in, uh, particularly with regards to those microbes um, that live on plants or in soil that play a key role in carbon sequestration. For example, like can we, how are these changes in climate going to be influencing the microbes that we know are important for a lot of these ecosystem processes? Okay. Um, Ruth was struck by the same thing that struck me, which is the idea of these microbes having microbes. How did... Is, did you show a picture that sh showed that one, there was one inside it, 40 microns compared to 50 microns? How do you even get a microbe inside another microbe? Is, oh. that, is that what the scale was? Um, so the testate amoeba, right? Right. Right. So that is on the eukaryote side of mm -hmm. the tree of life. It's not a bacteria. So it's quite large. Um, and the uh, testate amoeba first eats the diatom and then it glues pieces of the diatom left over so its shell essentially to its shell it's actually producing its own glue if you will to do this so so the yeah. amoeba are like 50 microns yeah the amoeba, the amoeba are pretty big themselves right mm -hmm. okay yeah i mean it's pretty striking um there's a couple of questions about that amazing video that you showed with the glass and yeah. the ice. One is, why didn't that shatter? Which is a different question. But um, another is wondering if teachers can get those um, ice nucleate. That was an amazing demo, and every educator on this webinar wants to do it. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I love these ice nucleating bacteria. So the glass probably didn't shatter because um, it's lab glass, so it's meant to be very temperature resistant. So if the temperature changes quite quickly, it won't shatter and it doesn't then hurt the person working in the laboratory, which we like safety, safety's good. Um, yeah, so I, I know that oftentimes like uh, community college and college courses get a hold of Pseudomonas syringiae. I don't know where an educator could go to buy it. 
Um, I know where I could go to buy it, but I'm not sure that educators can go to the same places. Um, I, yeah. Hmm. Would, you please, could, would you please uh, put your source in the chat if you, if you get a chance? Yeah. And, uh, that would be a good thing to check. Yeah, I can, or I can um, look for it and then email it to one of you two maybe or something. Sure, that would be a good follow-up. Yeah, and so also take home point is don't try this at home without lab glass. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, if you have like a, if you have glass that you use in your classroom that's meant to withstand heat transfer changes, then you can use that. But yeah, don't, don't use it in, you know, whatever vase you got at the thrift store, probably not the best <laughs> option. <laughs> Right. Um, and I think you partially answered this question with the earlier one, but Patrick asked if there's uh, methane producing bacteria on the leaf surface or is the methane coming from somewhere else? So that's a good question. Um, we have found, I mean, there, there are certainly methanogens that live in the environment, um, but it's not necessarily, so there could be other bacteria that are producing the methane. That's one option. The other option is the environment is producing the methane. Um, which might not be so likely. And the third option is actually that these methane eating bacteria are not actually eating methane normally. When the methane's around, they're eating it. But when the methane's not around, they can actually eat uh, methanol, which is actually the next kind of step. They change methane into methanol and then it goes down the course. So um, a lot of uh, organisms that eat methanol live on plant surfaces, it's pretty common to find them there because the plants produce a lot of that just normally. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to know. Um, a clarification, Noah, for the um, fingerprint and keyboard graph. There's a question about what were the axes on that graph again? Oh yeah, um, yeah. So, so what we're trying to do here, so that it's really hard to visualize these data because for each sample we have, let's say, a hundred or more bacteria per sample, and often, and there's very few that are shared, right? So this is essentially an ordination plot to to condense all that information in essentially two dimensions, because our our brains can barely handle three dimensions, let alone you know mm -hmm. five thousand dimensions or more, right? Um, so all, essentially all it does is it's collapsing it just to, just to visualize the overall pattern. So the key point is just that um, with the points that are close together represent similar bacterial communities, essentially, and points that are far apart are really distinct communities. But all, again, all it's really highlighting is that um, the bacteria on your fingertips are pretty similar to those left on your keyboard. And the bacteria on your fingertips are going to look a lot different from, from somebody else's fingertips. Okay. Yeah, it's a complicated graphic. I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, we could follow that up. And uh, Patrick asks if there's any similarity uh, between the vaginal microbial community and the skin microbial community on women that were tested. You made a distinction between skin bacteria and other bacteria. Yeah, so they're quite distinct communities. Um, not surprising. Very different in habitats. Very distinct uh, types of tax that we see. Um, but yeah, the, the, the infants that were born, that were vaginally delivered, most of their, the, the, even the skin on the infants, it basically looked like vaginal microbes, at least initially. Um, and again, it's probably because, you know, they're, they're essentially going through this microbial rich environment on their way out and they're getting inoculated with, with these bacteria and then versus C-section delivered, uh, babies, the, their skin bacteria looks a lot more like, like skin bacteria from, from adults. And, and again, it's just because that's that's their first inoculum is just being being touched. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's and, and and getting back to what Hannah was talking about, you know, the, the next question is is well, does this lead to health effects downstream? And that's we don't know. But there's a lot of work, and Hannah mentioned some of it, where people are trying to can you actually inoculate C-section delivered babies with vaginal bacteria? Because maybe there's some protective effect of having those bacteria for preventing you know, potentially allergies in the future or skin disorders in, in, more, in the more immediate future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that because this field is just exploding with all the new methodology, there's a lot, there's a lot more questions than answers right now. But um, let's see. So here's, here's a really interesting question. Um, how do antibacterial soaps and other impacts 
other chemicals impact uh, human microbes and, and possibly human health? Now, there's been a lot of uh, talk about that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, antibiotics are a big problem, right? They're all over our environment. People put antibiotics in their wall paint, I heard. Um, that's kind of crazy. Uh, and, yeah, definitely. <laughs> It, so there's two problems with that. One is that um, it might be that you're killing good things along with the bad things. And two is uh, the ones that survive, anything that survives uh, antibiotics, right, they're becoming resistant to those antibiotics, which makes those antibiotics useless for anything in the future. So it's actually really tricky, and you um, don't want to use antibiotics except for as kind of a, a last, you know, ditch effort before uh, you, you know, at the very end, because if you use them, just, you know, you get a cold, you use some antibiotics, right? Or if you're always, you know, wiping something down with antibiotics, you're essentially selecting organisms that can survive that, meaning that if something really nasty does come along and it manages to survive, or it manages to learn how to survive from another organism that's living there because bacteria can share information like that, then that's going to be left on the surface, but you no longer have a weapon to use against it. Mm -hmm. And that's related to another question that's in the chat, which is that if you have beneficial um, microbes, they may outcompete the, the uh, non-beneficial or the harmful pathogens, as you showed. So... You're essentially just deselecting all of your potential diversity in your environment. Get right. Yeah. 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 Okay. The hard part, of course, is how do you identify the good ones? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's the hard part. And there's lots of companies out there that will try to convince you they've got this figured out. But it's, it's very much an area of active research. And it's, and it's also very context dependent. So you can have microbes that in some situations are beneficial, but then all of a sudden you get a wound. Right? And they're in a different environment on your body, and then all of a sudden they can become really problematic. Um, so it's it's not going to be as simple, I don't think, in my opinion, it's going to be as simple as just, all right, here's this magic bacterial cocktail, everyone's going to be healthy from now on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely an area of active research for sure. Mm -hmm. Your systems are complex, and the bacteria that live in and on you and in your house, those that is an ecosystem right there. So. Mm -hmm. To tweak that, it's imagine going out to, you know, a mountain range and deciding that we're going to remove this animal and everything will be perfect. That <laughs> usually doesn't actually happen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, let's see, we'll take uh, one, more, one more question before we close. Um, is there any study relating bacteria community from people living in cold weather versus people living in warm weather? Are there similarities or some sort of pattern associated with that? That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer. I mean, I know there's been some work looking at geographic variability, particularly in skin bacteria. Um, and there does appear to be some geographic variability. For example, if you go to areas um, in Asia, you'll oftentimes find different bacteria on the skin than people in New York City, for example. The hard part is knowing why that is. Right, because it could just be that the exposures to different bacteria in our environment are different. It could be diet related. I mean, who knows? I mean, you can come up with a thousand possible explanations for why those differences exist. But the fact is, is there is um, there can there is a possibility that for some of these communities, there is some sort of geographic variability. But it's hard to know why that variability might exist. And then for some, you know, you know there's just so many factors that are influencing these communities. That it's hard to tease that apart. Mm -hmm kind of the non-answer, I guess. <laughs> so I apologize. Well, I mean, I'll purpose answer that it depends. <laughs> so um, with that, I want to thank uh, Noah and Hannah. And I want to point out that uh, we've got a few resources for you on this last slide. Um, a lot of these are uh, articles about some of, some of the work that you've heard about today. Uh, there's a link to the Fiera Lab Group if you want to look at some of the publications that uh, they've put out or, or see some other things. Also, Hannah has a blog called A, Pi a Pipette and an Open Mind, um, where she blogs about her research. And so uh, I invite you to take a look at any and all of those resources. I've also got the request in the chat um, to see if we can find some papers on uh, atmospheric 
cycling. Um, so we'll make note of that. Uh, let us know if you have other questions and we'll, we're going to follow up via email with you. Um, we'd also love to see you at one of our other events coming up. Uh, we've got Thursday, March 10th, and uh, if you'd like to be at that, you can register for that right now. And uh, with that, I'd like to wish everybody a very good evening or morning or whatever it is where you are, and uh, hope to see you back here for some more microbial fun in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.